Good morning. Welcome to God's house. Happy to have you all here this morning. We've reached the 14th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. If there's one fear that seems to transcend time and space that that most people hold, it's a fear of being lost. In fact, the internet has even come up with a technical term for it, maziophobia, being lost in a maze. I say the internet because it's not a technical, clinical term. But we're afraid of being lost, and it's unsettling when you are lost physically in somewhere in our world, but it's even more unsettling and even more dangerous when we are spiritually lost. So the question that we're going to ask this morning and answer is, are you lost? And you may be surprised by the answer. That will be the focus for our worship. Please join in singing our first hymn, hymn 308, the first four stanzas. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children, but we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for this 14th Sunday in the season of Pentecost comes to us from the book of the prophet Hosea, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. In the time of Hosea, Israel was lost. The problem was they didn't realize how lost they were, and so the Lord told Hosea to come up with an object lesson to show the Israelites just how lost they were. And he uses a somewhat striking image. He says, Hosea, go and find a prostitute, a harlot. And this prostitute, this harlot, was supposed to be a picture of Israel. Just as prostitutes, harlots, are unfaithful to uh, their husbands if they are married, they are faithless, they are promiscuous. So the Lord is teaching Israel, you have been unfaithful to me. You have been idolatrous and gone after other gods. But the amazing thing is that after the Lord uses this picture of an unfaithful harlot, he tells Hosea, now go marry her. Go marry this woman who has been with so many different men. And that striking picture is to show us God's love. That he doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves up before he comes and gets us but rather he comes to us and washes us of our sin. The Lord said to me, go again. Show love to a woman who is loved by another man, a woman who keeps committing adultery. Show love just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, even though they keep turning to other gods and loving the raisin cakes. So I bought her for myself for 15 pieces of silver and nine bushels of barley. I said to her, you will stay with me for many days. You must not be promiscuous. You must not be with any other man and I also will be for you. So the people of Israel will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred memorial stones, and without the special vest or family idols. Afterward, the people of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our psalm of the day. It's Psalm 51a on page 86 in the front of the hymn.
The second lesson comes to us from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Paul was dealing with a situation of terrible lostness in the Christian church in Corinth. First of all, another case of sexual immorality. A man was having sexual relations with his father's wife, which was basically incest. Paul says that not even the unbelieving world would tolerate such a thing. That man was, was definitely lost. But, but so was the rest of the church because Paul says the church bragged how, about how tolerant and open-minded they were. We even have a guy who's living in an incestuous relationship. Look at how accommodating we are. So both that man and the church were lost and, and Paul finds them there in that filth and he brings them to their senses. He says you cannot tolerate sin like this. You cannot be open-minded in this way when God says something is wrong. So he, urges, he urged the Christian church there to excommunicate this man for his sin, to bring him to his senses. And, and when the Corinthian church did come to their senses and call him to repentance, he repented, and then he was found again. And now Paul encourages them to forgive him so that he doesn't be overcome by despair. Paul writes, now if anyone has caused sorrow, he has not done it to me, but to all of you to some extent, not to overstate it. This punishment inflicted on such a person by the majority is enough, so that instead you should rather forgive and comfort him, or else such a person could be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. For that reason, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. In fact, this was also the purpose of my writing. I wanted to know the result of your being tested, that is, if you are obedient in all things. If you forgive anyone anything, I do too. To be sure, I have, if I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven it in the presence of Christ for your sake, so that Satan would not take advantage of us. We are certainly not unaware of his schemes. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our next hymn. It's hymn number 304, the first four stanzas. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. We read from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him. 
But the Pharisees and the experts in the law were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He told them this parable. Which one of you, if you had 100 sheep and lost one of them, would not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls together his friends and his neighbors, telling them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who do not need to repent. Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, would not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, because I have found the lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of our Lord, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Your fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, who welcomes sinners. You may have noticed a trend over the past few weeks that we've been focusing in our sermons on Jesus' parables. And you've probably noticed that when you come across one of Jesus' parables, there's more there that than meets the eye. For example, two weeks ago we had the parable of the, the wedding banquet and picking seats at a wedding banquet. And it wasn't really about etiquette at a wedding banquet. Neither was last week's parable about how to build a tower or how to go to war. And in the same way, today's parables are not about how to find a lost sheep or how to find a lost coin. The problem is, the trouble is that because parables are deeper than just the surface meaning, it's easy to kind of twist them to fit your own agenda. For example, if you wanted to raise money, you could say, well, look at this coin. Look how valuable just one of those coins that's in your pocket is to God. Or much more common, and I think even in our circles this would be much more common, is to teach that these parables are about, about outreach. That we are to picture ourselves as the shepherd and the woman, and we need to get out there and beat the bushes to find lost sinners and bring them to saving faith in Jesus. The problem is that this can't be about us. We can't just inject our own interpretation into these words because Luke tells us what the context is of these parables. He says that it, they are Jesus' direct response to the Pharisees and the experts in the law complaining, this man welcomes sinners. So how do we get here? What's the context? Well, Luke's gospel as a whole is one that focuses a lot on the sick and the weak in the world and how Jesus comes to save them, to seek and to save them. Jesus had really made it a policy in his ministry to meet and even eat with the outcasts of society, the tax collectors and the sinners. In fact, he even called a tax collector named Matthew to be one of his apostles. And later on in Luke chapter 19, the Lord will be walking down a road and see Zacchaeus, a tax collector, up in a tree and say, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. And when he was at Zacchaeus' house, he proclaimed the most amazing thing. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. It was only natural for Jesus, who is the good shepherd, to, to love and to seek and to find poor lost sinners. Here's the striking thing. Jesus' natural love for the lost filled religious elite with disgust. They couldn't believe that Jesus would meet with the eggs of society, much less eat with them. The striking thing, the sad thing, is that these were the very men who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Israel. They were to be the shepherds of God's flock on earth. And yet they didn't. They harassed the flock. They beat the flock. By, by proclaiming, instead of God's grace, by proclaiming God's wrath, by heavily emphasizing the law rather than the gospel. In other words, the message that the people would have been hearing from these Pharisees and experts in the law was, you need to clean yourself up. You need to get rid of your sins. You need to make yourself holy before 
God will ever pay you any attention. They despised these poor sinners, these tax collectors, these prostitutes, these dregs of society. They had no love at all in their hearts for them. They figured they were just getting what they deserved. And they walked around with their heads held high, thinking how much better they were than them. And so in the parable then, the first parable, these Pharisees and experts in the law are the 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. And I think Jesus is being somewhat ironic or sarcastic here. They did need to repent. The Pharisees and the experts in the law were sinners just like everyone else, part of the glory of God. These Pharisees, these experts in the law, they needed to repent just as much as the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the rest of society needed to. And so the real tragedy in this story is not that Jesus is eating with social outcasts, but rather that the Pharisees didn't see their need to join them. They didn't see their need for forgiveness from Jesus. And so Jesus tells these two parables to drive that point across, that No matter how good you look on the outside, you need to repent. The first parable is about a sheep. Which one of you, if you had 100 sheep and lost one of them, would not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that was lost until he finds it? I think when you first hear that, you think, "Hmm, that sounds right. If you lose one of your sheep from the flock, you go and, and hunt it down. The problem is, in those days, when you had your sheep out in the wilderness, your flock, you were the only defense as a shepherd. I imagine the shepherds who were listening to Jesus tell this parable would turn to each other and say, this guy better stick to carpentry because he doesn't know a darn thing about shepherding. If you have a hundred sheep out in the wilderness with lions and bears around, you're not going to abandon the 99 for the one, leave the rest of them at risk. You just... You kind of write that one off as dead. You cut your losses. That's not what a responsible shepherd would do. And that's a common thing with parables, right? It's a a twist on reality. It's not the way we would normally think. Or in the second parable, or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, would not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully she finds it? It's hard to transfer monetary terms from first century to 21st century, but I I don't know. Imagine that you had 10 $100 bills and you lose one of them. And I know a lot of us would say, that's a lot of money. I'm not going to just cut my losses there. But if you lose it in the morning before work, would you rip the house apart searching for it? Would you put your life on hold for $100 when you know you still have $900 in your wallet? Probably not. I mean, you might look for it later. You, you might hope it turns up. But you're not going to stop your life. You're not going to rip up the carpet in your house just to find that money. Again, there's a twist on reality that Jesus puts on it. So what's, what's the point that Jesus is making here? Well, his point is that God and Jesus, as the Son of God, do not see things the way the Pharisees did. The Pharisees and the experts in the law were caught up in this thinking that a person has to make themselves right, righteous, and holy before God will accept them. That you must make God happy with you. And so they drilled that into the people, that it's the responsibility of you to get rid of your sin. You must obey the law in order to please God. And you know what the the prostitutes and the tax collectors realized? I can't do it. I can't keep the law as God wants me to. So Jesus is teaching them that God doesn't look at people that way, that he doesn't expect you to clean yourself up. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, Paul said, of which I am the worst. Jesus didn't die for his friends, but as Paul says in Romans 5, he came to die for his enemies. While we were still his enemies, Jesus died for us. The beating heart of Jesus is what we should see here. That He came to save the lost. He didn't come to save the found. The Pharisees and the experts in the law thought they were found. They thought they were in. They thought that God was pleased with them just the way they were. And so they didn't understand why Jesus would come and eat and meet open sinners. 
Now, this theme of lostness is, is most directly applying to those tax collectors and those sinners, but it's really a theme that transcends time and space, doesn't it? I think all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Who was lost in the Garden of Eden? Of course, Adam was after the fall into sin. He was so lost that he went hiding in the bushes and he tried to cover up his shame with fig leaves. But the Lord didn't let him stay lost, did he? The Lord came to him. The Lord covered him and covered his shame and brought him to repentance. The hard truth for us today is that we are all like Adam. We are all like sheep who have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own ways. We have violated God's law by our thoughts and words and actions in more ways than we can even count. We have chosen our way rather than the Lord's way. If we were keeping track, there's not one of us that should say, I'm better than all those people out there because we are all completely sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And yet you sense that lostness in our world, don't you? How lost and depressed and despairing people are. You see people trying to find meaning for their lives and their jobs or the people around them, their friends, or their notoriety on social media. And it just leaves them empty. You see people thinking that if they could only change their gender, then they would be happy. Or if they could only disobey the natural law that says one man and one woman should be married, that that will make them satisfied, that that will give meaning to their life. But they're still empty on the inside. And I don't think it's just people out there that sense that lostness, that emptiness, right? You sense it in your own heart. Maybe Christians sense it more acutely because we know what God demands of us and we know that we don't live up to it. We know that God wants us to be perfect and we know that we're far from it. We long to be what God wants us to be and we just can't do it. We long to be home with our Father in His house in heaven. And yet we're still lost out here in the wilderness of this broken world. And sometimes you just want to curl up in a ball like a little child who's lost in a shopping mall and just cry. And how lost we are. And how we cannot find our way out. But that's exactly what makes this section of Luke so incredible. Some have called it the, the heart of Luke's Gospel. Because Jesus knows very well that we are lost on our own. But that's exactly why He came. He left the glory of heaven to find what was lost. He gave up the glory, the riches of heaven to be born as a man. He wandered through the wilderness of this same world that we are wandering through with all of its temptations, with all of its brokenness, with all of its fallenness. The cross where He took our sins, our lostness, and He lost His life. He was lost in the depths of hell for our sins. So that we may be found. And now Jesus comes to us and says, you were lost, but I found you. He came to us even when we probably didn't want to be found. When we were content in our sinfulness. When we thought this is just the way I am and God will have to accept me the way I am. He came to us, he searched for us with the means of grace, with the gospel and word and sacrament, and he found us and he said, I died for you too. Come and join my Father's family. Welcome into my Father's kingdom. Jesus didn't care what He could get from us. And He didn't expect us to clean ourselves up before He found us. In fact, it's just like Hosea and that harlot, that prostitute, right? When when Jesus found us, we were up to our necks in the filth of our own sinfulness. And Jesus didn't say, clean yourself up. He said, Have my forgiveness and you will be clean. What an amazing story this is of finding the lost. You know, even especially in the the parable of the coin, that a coin can't find itself, right? It can't return to the pocket of its owner. Jesus came and found us. We didn't find him. We were lost, not Jesus. So don't ask anyone if they've found Jesus. No one can find Jesus You can only be found by Jesus. 
Now that's striking that heaven rejoices, right? When one sinner repents. That's another part of these parables that just doesn't make sense, right? If you were a shepherd and you lost one sheep, one sheep went wandering off, and you did go and find him, would you throw a party over that? I think I'd smack that sheep on the butt for getting himself lost, right? Or if you find that $100 bill somewhere in your house, would you call all your friends and say, rejoice with me, I found my $100 bill? Your friends would be like, I think you need to prioritize your life a little bit better. This is not a reason to throw a party. It's not a Packer game, right? This is an amazing story of the, the grace of God that even when we were lost, He found us. Which raises the question, what does it mean to be found? What is it that causes heaven to rejoice? Now you might think, well, it's because now these tax collectors and sinners, now they're going to shape up. Now they're going to live better lives and, and heaven rejoices over that. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? He says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now you can't see it in the English translation here, but this is a present participle, this uh, word for repent. Meaning, there is joy in heaven over a sinner who is repenting. Constantly repenting. Ongoing repenting. Heaven rejoices when sinners like us come here week after week after week repenting and confessing our sin. I know that sounds strange. A parent would, would rejoice, would, would brag on social media about their child who confessed that they broke the lamp. Right? Do parents post that? Rejoice with me, all my social media friends. My child broke a lamp. But they confessed it. No, we, when we post on social media bragging about our children that they got straight A's or they got accepted into a, a, a great college. But that's exactly the twist, right? That heaven rejoices when filthy sinners confess those sins and receive the joy of forgiveness, then heaven rejoices. I know with a, a quick superficial reading of this, you might think, this must be out there. The lost are those people that don't go to church on Sunday mornings. The lost are those who lead openly wicked lives. The lost may be some of Risen Savior's own members who haven't been to church in some time. But if you think that way, you still don't understand this parable. See, Jesus, his parables often invite us to identify ourselves with one of the characters. So which of the characters do we fit with? Are we the shepherd or the woman who's searching for the coin? No, Jesus takes that role for himself. He is the good shepherd. He's the one who, who rips up the house looking for the lost coin. Are we the, the lost sheep then and the lost coin? Well, we probably don't want to identify that way. I don't think we like to think of ourselves as lost. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But here's the thing, if we're not the lost coin and the lost sheep, there's only one other role in these parables, and that is of the 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. And if that's the way we ever think, if we think like those Pharisees that we're the good people because here we are sitting in God's house worshiping Him, bringing Him our generous offerings, taking time out of our day to sing His praises, then we're just like those Pharisees and tax collector or Pharisees and experts in the law who sneered at the lost. And really, if you think you're found because of your own actions, then you're truly lost. But the lost can still be found. Bring your sins to Jesus and he will wipe them all away. In some circles these days, it's become to not talk about sin much in church anymore. In fact, there are some heretics who actually teach that once you become a Christian, once you make your decision for Christ, you're no longer a sinner. Probably the most famous of these is a woman called Joyce Meyer. Uh, she said publicly, very publicly, that she doesn't believe she is a sinner anymore. She's not miserable. She's not wretched. And, and the only realization that she needed to come to was that she wasn't a wretched sinner. She stopped sinning the moment she got it through her head that she wasn't a sinner. Well, I would accuse her of the sin of pride, right? Bragging about how sinless she was. 
But here's the thing. There are no parties in heaven for those who think they are good enough for God on their own. There are only parties in heaven for those who realize that they are not good enough and desperately need Jesus to find them with his forgiveness. So, are you lost? I think the answer would be yes. And the good news is that Jesus' full attention is on the lost, that heaven rejoices when the lost are found. And if you identify as lost this morning, the good news is that Jesus welcomes you and eats with you. Amen. Stand as we respond with stanzas 5, 6, and 7 of hymn 304. Join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone to trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus as stewards truly receive, and gladly as thou blessest us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. Please stand for the responsive prayer of the church. Eternal God and Father, we give you thanks for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Help us to rejoice in these blessings, dear Lord, and to use them faithfully for the glory of your name. Jesus Christ, Lord of the Church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us in the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, and in the searching eyes of the lost. Help us to see your face, O Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Awaken us to the opportunities you give to proclaim your message of love. Holy Spirit, giver of life, through word and sacrament, bestow on us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. Set our hearts on fire as we work and witness for Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for a family member, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a friend who does not believe in you, or whose faith is weak or troubled. Bless the church with men and women who are willing to proclaim your word in places where we cannot go. Keep them and their loved ones in your care, and let nothing hinder their work. By the power of the gospel, restore their spirits each day so that they do not lose heart as they serve us and others. Wherever your word is proclaimed, O Lord, grant it success. Let your kingdom come to us and others, so that we and many more might join the assembly of saints and angels to sing your praise forever. Savior of all, hear our prayer, and help us in our mission. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, number 385, the first three stanzas.
please stand for prayer and blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated for stanzas four and five. 